Representation theory of finite groups, lecture 14, Specht modules. Let us start with briefly recalling our setup from the previous lecture. We fix a positive integer n and a partition lambda of n. So we will view this partition at the Young diagram. Let S sub lambda be the Young subgroup of the symmetric group Sn corresponding to lambda. Denote by yt of lambda the set of all Young tableaus of shape lambda. And we also denote by ytd of lambda the set of all Young tabloids of shape lambda. A Young tabloid is a row equivalence class of Young tableaus. The set brackets denote the natural projection map from the set of all Young tableaus to the set of all Young tabloids. The symmetric group Sn acts naturally both on the set of all Young tableaus of shape lambda and on the set of all Young tabloids of shape lambda. It acts by permuting the entries of the corresponding tableaus or tabloids. We know that the linearization of the action of Sn on the set of all Young tableaus of shape lambda is isomorphic to the regular Sn module. And we have defined the permutation module m upper lambda as the linearization of the action of Sn on the set of all Young tabloids of shape lambda. And we have proved that this permutation module is isomorphic both to the induced trivial module, where we induce from S lambda to Sn, and to the coset module of Sn modulo S lambda acting on the right. Next, we need to talk about the notions of row and column stabilizers for tableaus. Let T be a young tableau of shape lambda. The row stabilizer RT of T is defined as a set of all elements sigma in Sn, such that T and sigma of T are row equivalent. In other words, an element sigma belongs to the row stabilizer of T, if and only if it permutes elements inside each row of T. It is very easy to check that RT is a subgroup of Sn. Also note that directly from the definition, we have that the tabloid corresponding to T is exactly the orbit of T under its row stabilizer RT. Similarly, we define the column stabilizer CT of T as the set of all elements sigma in Sn, such that sigma permutes elements inside each column of T. And similarly to the row stabilizer, the column stabilizer of T is a subgroup of Sn. For example, if we take the following Young tableau of shape 2 to 1, so which contains 1 and 2 in the first row, 3 and 4 in the second row, and 5 in the third row, then the row stabilizer of T is a direct product of the symmetric groups on 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. This is because the first row of t is 1 and 2. You can permute 1 and 2 arbitrarily. The second row of t is 3 and 4, so we can permute 3 and 4 arbitrarily. And the third row of t is 5. So similarly, the column stabilizer of t is the direct product of the symmetric group on 1, 3, and 5, because 1, 3, and 5 is the first column of t. And the symmetric group on 2 and 4. This is because 2 and 4 is the second row of t. So next, let us talk about polytabloids. For any subset H of Sn, we define the corresponding symmetrizer, denoted H upper plus, as a sum of all elements in H. And we define the corresponding antisymmetrizer, denoted H upper minus, as the signed sum of all elements in H. So this is a sum over all h in h of h times the sine of h. For example, if we take as h the set of the following elements, the identity, the transposition of 1 and 2, the transposition of 3 and 4, and the product, 
the transposition of 1 and 2 and the transposition of 3 and 4, then h plus is equal to the identity plus 1, 2 plus 3, 4 plus 1, 2 times 3, 4. And h minus is equal to the identity minus 1, 2. This is because the transposition of 1, 2 is an odd element. It has sign minus. Minus 3, 4, similarly, and then plus 1, 2 times 3, 4. This is because the product of two transpositions is an even element, and so the sign is plus. So now we can define polytabloids. Definition. For a young tableau T of shape lambda, define the corresponding polytabloid ET as the image of the tabloid of T under the action of the anti-symmetrizer corresponding to the column stabilizer of T. Note that by the definition, the original tabloid T appears in the polytabloid ET with coefficient one, because any non-trivial element of the column stabilizer swaps two elements in different rows of T and so maps it to a different polytabloid. In particular, the element ET is non-zero for any T in YT lambda. Also note that inside the regular module, which is given by the action of Sn on the set of all Young tableaus of shape lambda, the element ET is obtained from T by first symmetrizing using the row stabilizer of T. So this is how we get tabloids. And then we anti-symmetrize using the column stabilizer of T. So we play the rows and columns against each other in this definition in two different ways, by symmetrizing with respect to one and anti-symmetrizing with respect to the other. Let us consider some examples. Example one, consider the young tableau T of shape 3,2 with elements 1, 2, and 3 in the first row and 4 and 5 in the second row. Then the column stabilizer of this T consists of the symmetric group on 1 and 4 and of the symmetric group on 2 and 5. So it has four elements, the identity, the transposition of 1 and 4, which is odd, so the sign is minus, the transposition of 2 and 5, which is odd, so the sign is minus, and their product, which is even, so the sign is plus. So the corresponding polytabloid ET is equal to the tabloid T acted upon by the element, the identity minus the transposition of one and four, minus the transposition of two and five, and plus the product. So if we apply identity to T, we just get T. If we apply to T the transposition of one and four, we get the tabloid, which has the first row four, two, and three, and the second row is one, five. So we will have this tabloid with a sign minus in ET. If we apply to T the transposition of two and five, we get the tabloid with the first row one, five, three, and the second row four and two. And this also comes with a sign minus. And finally, if we apply to T the product of the transpositions of one, four, and two, five, we get 4, 5, 3 in the first row and 1, 2 in the second row, and the sign is plus. Here is the second example. Let us take the young tableau S of shape 1, 1, 1, with 1 in the first row, 2 in the second row, and 3 in the third row. Then the column stabilizer of this S is the symmetric group S3. So the symmetric group of the elements 1, 2, and 3. It has six elements, so the identity which is even, three transpositions, 1, 2, 2, 3, and 1, 3, which are odd, so they will come with sign minus, and two three cycles, 1, 2, 3, and 1, 3, 2. So they are even, they come with plus signs. 
So ES is equal to the tabloid of S, which is the same as the tableau of S in this case, and then acted upon by this anti-symmetrizer. So we get the tabloid 1 to 3 minus the tabloid 2, 1, 3, minus the tabloid 1, 3, 2, minus the tabloid 3 to 1, plus the tabloid 2, 3, 1, and plus the tabloid 3, 1, 2. So before we proceed, we need the following useful lemma. For any element sigma in Sn, and for any young tableau T of shape lambda, we have the following. First of all, the row stabilizer of sigma T is obtained from the row stabilizer of T by conjugation with sigma. Similarly, the column stabilizer of sigma T is obtained from the column stabilizer of T by conjugation with sigma. Next, the anti-symmetrizer for the column stabilizer of sigma T is equal to the anti-symmetrizer for the column stabilizer of T conjugated by sigma. And finally, the polytabloid for sigma T is equal to sigma applied to the polytabloid of T. Proof. For the first claim, we use the following computation. So P belongs to the row stabilizer of sigma T if and only if P applied to the tabloid of sigma T is equal to the tabloid of sigma T. We can rewrite this by moving sigma from the right-hand side out and then multiplying it with sigma inverse as sigma inverse P sigma applied to the tabloid of T is equal to the tabloid of T. This is true if and only if the element sigma inverse P sigma belongs to the row stabilizer of T. And again, multiplying with sigma and sigma inverse, we get that this is true if and only if P belongs to sigma times the row stabilizer of T times sigma inverse. And this is exactly what was claimed. And claims two and three are proved similarly. For the last claim, we use the second claim, which we have just proved, to make the following computation. The polytabloid for sigma t is, by definition, the anti-symmetrizer for the column stabilizer of sigma t applied to the tabloid of sigma t. But from claim 2, we know that the anti-symmetrizer for the column stabilizer of sigma t is equal to sigma times the anti-symmetrizer for the column stabilizer of T times sigma inverse. And now we see here the sigma inverse, and then we have the tabloid of sigma T. So we can cancel sigma inverse and sigma and get sigma times CT minus times the tabloid of T. And CT minus times the tabloid of T is, by definition, the polytabloid for T. And this proves the last claim of the lemma. Now we are ready to define Specht modules. We denote by S upper lambda the linear span inside the permutation module M lambda of all polytabloids ET where T is a young tableau of shape lambda. Note that some of these polytabloids might coincide with each other or be linearly dependent. So these polytabloids only generate the Specht module, but they not necessarily form a basis of this module. A basis of the Specht module will be discussed in the next lecture. Lemma, S lambda is an Sn submodule of the permutation module. So this follows directly from the last claim on the previous slide, if we have a polytabloid and apply an element from Sn, we get another polytabloid. So the generating elements of S lambda are actually closed under the action of Sn. Therefore, the whole linear span of these elements is also closed under the action of Sn and hence is an Sn submodule of the permutation module. In particular, it also follows from the proof of the lemma that the Specht module is cyclic 
and is generated by any polytabloid ET. So S lambda is called the Specht module corresponding to lambda. And these modules were first defined and studied in the paper by William Specht from 1935, which is called the reducible representations of the symmetric group. So here are some examples. Example one, consider the partition lambda given just by one part n. So this is a partition of n. We have seen in the previous lecture that the corresponding permutation module is isomorphic to the trivial Sn module, and it has basis consisting of the unique tabloid of this shape. So all elements are in the first row. There is only one row. So in this case, the column stabilizer of any Young tableau of shape N is just the identity. And therefore, all polytabloids are equal to this unique tabloid of this shape. It follows that the Specht module for this partition N is isomorphic actually to the permutation module for this partition and is isomorphic to the trivial Sn module. Example two, let's take the other extreme case. Consider the partition lambda consisting of all parts equal to one, 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 n times. So this is a partition of n, and we know that in this case, the permutation module is isomorphic to the regular Sn module. And we also know that in this case, Young tableaus and Young tabloids are the same thing. So in particular, it follows that the column stabilizer for any Young tableau, in this case, is the whole symmetric group. Hence, in this case, any polytabloid, ET, where T is a Young tableau of shape one to the power N, is equal to plus or minus sum over all sigma in SN, sine of sigma times the tabloid where you have sigma of one in the first row, sigma of two in the second row, and so on. In particular, it follows that the Specht module for this partition is isomorphic to the sine module over the symmetric group. So this is the canonical basis of the sine submodule of the regular Sn module. Finally, consider one more less trivial example. Consider the partition n minus 1 comma 1 of n, in which case we know that the corresponding permutation module is isomorphic to the natural module with the basis given by the following tabloids. So if we take j to be an element between 1 and n, we can consider the tabloid of shape n minus 1, 1, where j occupies the second row. So in this case, if we take the young tableau t, which has i and j in the first column, the corresponding column stabilizer is equal to the identity and the transposition of i and j. Therefore, the corresponding polytabloid is just the difference of the basis element for j minus the basis element for i. Consequently, the Specht module S n minus 1 comma 1 is simply the complement to the trivial submodule of the natural module inside the natural module given by the permutation module m n minus 1 comma 1. And recall, of course, that we have already used the notation S n minus 1 comma 1, and now we have explained this notation. A very important role in what follows will be played by the statement called the sine lemma. So consider the inner product on the permutation module, which is uniquely defined by prescribing that the inner product between two tabloids T and S is equal to the Kronecker delta between T and S. So here T and S are two arbitrary Young tabloids of shape lambda. It is fairly straightforward to check that this inner product on the permutation module is Sn invariant. So now the formulation of the sine lemma. 
Let H be a subgroup of Sn. Claim 1. For any element G in H, the product of G with the anti-symmetrizer of H in any order is equal to this anti-symmetrizer times the sign of G. Claim 2. For any two elements X and Y in the permutation module, the inner product between the image of X under the anti-symmetrizer H minus and Y is equal to the inner product between X and the image of Y under the anti-symmetrizer H minus. Claim 3. If H contains the transposition of A and B for some different elements A and B, then the anti-symmetrizer H minus can, can be factored as some element U times the identity minus the transposition of A and B. And finally, claim four. If T is a young tableau of shape lambda and two elements A and B belong to the same row of T and additionally the transposition of A and B belongs to H, then the image of the tabloid of T under the symmetrizer of H minus is zero. So let us now prove this lemma. To prove claim one, we do the following computation. G times H minus is equal by definition G times the sum over all elements H in H, sine of H times H. So we move G into the sum and multiply it with sine of g squared. So we get sine of g times the sum over all elements h in h, and then the sine of gh times gh. So the sine is a homomorphism, so sine of g times sine of h is equal to the sine of gh. And since multiplication with g is just the permutation of the elements of h, this is equal to the sine of g times h minus. And similarly, one shows that H minus times G is the same thing, sine of G times H minus. And this proves claim one. To prove claim two, we do the following computation. The scalar product of H minus times X with Y is equal to, so we rewrite H minus as a sum over all H in H, sine H times H, then we can move the sum and the sign out, and we get the sum over all h and h sine h times the scalar product of hx and y. Since our inner product is as n invariant, we can rewrite the inner product between hx and y as the inner product between x and h inverse of y. And then we move the whole sum into the second component to get the inner product between x and the sum over all h and h sine of h times h inverse applied to y. But since the sine of h is equal to the sine of h inverse, we can also rewrite the sign in this way. And now we readily see that on the second place we have h minus times y. And this proves claim two. To prove claim three, we just know that the group h decomposes into the cosets with respect to the subgroup consisting of E and the transposition of A and B. So this is when the transposition of A and B belongs to H. And each coset has two elements, one of them is even and one of them is odd. So if we take the formula for H minus, we can split it into sums of elements from the cosets and in each coset we can move E minus A comma B out. And finally, to prove claim four, we know that under the assumptions that A and B are in the same row of T, the transposition of A and B belongs to the row stabilizer of T, so it doesn't change the tabloid of T. Hence, if we use claim three, we can rewrite H minus times the tabloid of T in the form some element u times the identity minus the transposition of a and b applied to the tabloid of t and the image of t under the identity and the transposition of a and b is the same 
it's t, and t minus t is zero. So we get zero. So this complete the proof of sign lemma. Next, let us talk about the dominance order. Let lambda and mu be two partitions of n. In the next definition, we use the convention that the partition is actually an infinite vector, and whenever we didn't have any parts, and all parts which don't exist are equal to zero. Definition. We say that the partition lambda dominates the partition mu, provided that for any i greater than or equal to one, the sum lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus and so on plus lambda i is greater than or equal to the sum mu 1 plus mu 2 plus and so on plus mu i. So the notation is that lambda dominates mu is given by this symbol, the triangle with one side closer to lambda. And directly from the definition, it follows easily that this defines a partial order on the set of all partitions of n. And this order is called the dominance order. So intuitively, the partition lambda dominates the partition mu, if and only if the Young diagram of lambda can be obtained from the Young diagram of mu by moving boxes upwards, so from lower rows to higher rows. So here is an example. So this is the Hasse diagram of the dominance order on the set of all partitions of six. So the partition six is the maximum element. And then the next one is five comma one. Then the next one is four comma two. And then in the next layer, we have both three three and four comma one comma one. So these two partitions are not comparable. The dominance order is not a linear order. So the next layer we have three, two, one. Then we have three, one, 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 and two, two, two. Then we have two, two, one, one. Then we have two, one, 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 one. And the minimum element in this order is one, 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 one. Okay, and an important property of the dominance order is given by the so-called dominance lemma for partitions. Let lambda and mu be two partitions of n. Let t be a young tableau of shape lambda and s be a young tableau of shape mu. Assume that for each row of s, the elements which are in that row of s are all in different columns of t then lambda dominates mu. Proof. We start by saying that from the assumptions, all elements of the first row of S belong to different columns of T. So therefore, we can permute columns of T such that we collect all those elements in the first row of T. Therefore, the first row of S is either equal to the first row of T or is shorter. So lambda one, is greater than or equal to mu1. Further, all elements in the second row of S are in different columns of T. So therefore, we can have an additional permutation of the columns of T, such that we collect all elements in the first row of S in the first row of T, and all elements in the first and in the second row of S in the first and in the second row of T. So this means exactly that lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is greater than or equal to mu 1 plus mu 2. And so on, we can complete the proof by induction. The sign lemma has a number of consequences. So the first one is the following. Let lambda and mu be two partitions of n, t a young tableau of shape lambda, and s a young tableau of shape mu. Then, if the antisymmetrizer of the column stabilizer of T times the tabloid of S is non-zero, then lambda dominates mu. If additionally lambda is equal to mu, then CT minus applied to S is the polytabloid of T up to a sign. Proof, let us start with the first claim. 
Assume that A and B are in the same row of S. Then they cannot be in the same column of T, because if they are in the same column of T, then we can factor the anti-symmetrizer for the column stabilizer of T, there should be no S here, as some element U times E minus A comma B. And therefore, by the sign lemma, since A and B are in the same row of T, the application of CT minus to S is equal to zero. Hence, lambda dominates mu by the dominance lemma. This proves the first claim. For the second claim, we note that under the assumption that lambda is equal to mu, the proof of the dominance lemma implies that S is equal to sigma of T for some sigma in the column stabilizer of T. Therefore, the application of CT minus to the tabloid of S is equal to the application of CT minus to sigma of T, where sigma is in CT. And then by the sine lemma, this is equal to the sine of sigma times CT minus applied to the tabloid of T. And this is plus or minus the polytabloid of T. So this completes the proof. Let us record the following corollary from the previous slide. For any Young tableau T of shape lambda, the linear operator CT minus projects the permutation module M lambda onto the one dimensional subspace generated by the polytabloid ET. Proof Write any element of the permutation module as a linear combination of tabloids. By the previous corollary, applying CT minus to any tabloid gives us the polytabloid ET up to a sign. Therefore, if we apply CT minus to V, we get a linear combination of ET with some coefficients. And this completes the proof. So now we can formulate the submodule theorem. Let N be a submodule of M lambda. Then either the Specht module S lambda is a submodule of N, or N is a submodule of the orthogonal complement of S lambda. So this theorem first appears in the paper by Gordon James from 1976 called the irreducible representations of the symmetric group. So we will prove this theorem on the next slide, but let us immediately recall the following corollary. So from this theorem, it follows immediately that the Specht module S lambda is simple. Indeed, if S lambda were not simple, it would have a non-trivial submodule, but then that submodule doesn't contain S lambda because it's a proper submodule, and it also doesn't belong to the orthogonal complement of S lambda because it's a part of S lambda. So this is a contradiction. So an immediate corollary from submodule theorem is that the Specht module S lambda is simple. So now let us prove the submodule theorem. For any element V of M lambda and any young tableau T of shape lambda, we know that CT minus V belongs to the linear span of ET. So CT minus projects the whole in M lambda onto the one dimensional subspace generated by the polytabloid ET. So we have to consider two cases. Case one, let us assume that there exists T such that if we apply CT minus to our submodule N, then the outcome is non-zero. So in this case, the outcome of course belongs to this one dimensional subspace generated by ET. In particular, it must contain ET because it's non-zero. So then ET belongs to N. But as lambda is cyclic and is generated by any ET, so it follows that in this case, S lambda is a submodule of N. Second case, assume that CT minus applied to N is zero for any T in YT lambda. Then for any V in N and any T in YT lambda, using the sign lemma, we can do the following computation. So the inner product between V and ET is equal to, so we write ET as CT minus of T, 
And then by the sign lemma, we can move CT minus to the right-hand side. We can have the inner product between CT minus V and the tabloid of T. But CT minus V is zero by our assumption. So this is an inner product between zero and something that is zero. In other words, this shows that any element of N is orthogonal to any polytabloid. In other words, N belongs to the orthogonal complement of S lambda because the polytabloids generate S lambda as a linear space. And this completes the proof of the submodule theorem. Next, let us discuss homomorphisms from Specht modules to permutation modules. Proposition 1. If lambda and mu are partitions of N, and they are such that there is a non-zero homomorphism from S lambda to M mu, then lambda dominates mu. Proof. Let phi be a non-zero homomorphism from S lambda to M mu. Then phi is injective because we have just proved that S lambda is a simple module. For any young tableau T of shape lambda, we have that the square of the anti-symmetrizer CT minus is equal to n factorial CT minus. This is very easy to check from the definitions. Hence, the image of ET under phi is equal to the image under phi of CT minus applied to T. But now we rewrite CT minus as one divided by n factorial CT minus squared and move 1 divided by n factorial ct minus out of phi. So we get 1 divided by n factorial ct minus phi applied to et. And the whole thing is non-zero. This means that ct minus acts as a non-zero linear operator on m mu. But we saw that this implies that lambda dominates mu. So this proves proposition 1. Proposition 2, for any partition lambda of n, the space of Sn homomorphisms from S lambda to M lambda is one-dimensional. Proof, fix T a young tableau of shape lambda. We know that S lambda is generated by the polytabloid E team, so if we have a homomorphism from S lambda to M lambda, we only need to see where we can map this E t because as soon as we mapped ET, the rest goes automatically because this lambda is generated by ET. So where can we map the polytabloid ET? So this polytabloid has a property that it belongs to the image of the linear map CT minus. But this linear map has one dimensional image on M lambda. So ET can only belong to this one dimensional space. And this means exactly that the dimension of Sn homomorphisms from S lambda to M lambda is at most one. But we know that there is at least one because S lambda is defined as a submodule of M lambda, and this completes the proof. So now we are ready to classify simple Sn modules. So our main theorem, the set of Specht modules S lambda, where lambda is a partition of N, is a complete and irredundant set of representatives of simple Sn modules. Proof? Let us assume that we have two modules S lambda and S mu, which are isomorphic. Then in particular, we have a non-zero home from S lambda to M mu. And hence, lambda dominates mu by the previous slide. But then we also have a non-zero home from S mu to M lambda and hence mu dominates lambda by the previous slide. In other words, two Specht modules are isomorphic if and only if the corresponding partitions coincide. So in particular, all Specht modules are pairwise non-isomorphic. But directly from the definition, they are indexed by partitions of N. And these partitions are in bijection with the conjugacy classes in Sn. Therefore, we know that simple modules for any group are in bijection with conjugacy classes from the general theory. And so it follows that Specht modules are indeed all simple Sn modules. 
So this completes the proof of our main theorem. And we can even say a little bit about the decomposition of a permutation module theorem. Let mu be a partition of n. Then the permutation module m mu decomposes into a direct sum of Specht modules S lambda with some multiplicities. And these multiplicities are non-zero only if lambda dominates mu. Proof. Assume that S lambda is a summand of m mu. Then there is a non-zero home from S lambda to m mu. And in particular, lambda dominates mu, as we saw in the previous slides. And also from the previous slides, we know that the multiplicity m lambda lambda is equal to 1. So these multiplicities are usually called the Kostka numbers, and we will give a combinatorial formula for these multiplicities a little bit later. Here is one example which we know. If we consider the partition n minus 1, 1, this is a partition of n, then we know that the corresponding permutation module is the natural Sn module. So we know that the trivial Sn module is the Specht module for the partition n, and it is a submodule, the natural module. And the complement to this trivial submodule of the natural module is exactly the Specht module S for the partition n minus 1, 1. So in other words, the natural module decomposes as s n minus 1, 1, direct sum s n. And n is the only partition which dominates n minus 1, 1 and is different from n minus 1, 1. So therefore, in this case, both multiplicities are equal to 1. So the multiplicity of n minus 1, 1 in itself and the multiplicity of n in itself. Okay, let's finish with some problems and questions. Question one, prove with all details that for any young tableau T of shape lambda, the corresponding row stabilizer and the column stabilizer are subgroups of SN. Question two, check with all details that the dominance order is a partial order on the set of all partitions of N. Question three, Prove that lambda dominates mu if and only if the Young diagram of lambda can be obtained from the Young diagram of mu by moving boxes upwards. Question four. Prove that the square of the anti-symmetrizer for the column stabilizer of T is equal to the n factorial times this anti-symmetrizer. And question five. Explain with all details how the submodule theorem implies the simplicity of S lambda. Thank you very much and see you next time.